which is a very good one. Obviously, they have Carolyn My name is Abigail Littlefield, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Landmark College and the Academic Speaker Series. Um, and I also want to let you know that we have three more speakers after tonight's event. And there are postcards on the table, oh, and in Jeff's hands. There are these blue things. There are postcards on the table back there, and you're welcome to help yourself to them. The postcards, that is, not the table. Um, <laughs> there's books back there. What are the books, Jeff? Are those, those aren't books and videos that you can check out. Library books and videos to be checked out if anybody would like it. Oh, okay. Library books and videos to be checked out. Um, tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Meg Mott who, uh, she's been teaching political theory. I get that wrong every single time, so I had to make sure that I got that wrong. At Marlboro College since 1999. And she wanted me to tell you that she is an academic uh, late bloomer, getting her bachelor's degree at age 37 and her PhD at age 46. However, having known Meg for over 20 years, I have to say that she has been an academic forever. And it just took a while for the letters to catch up. <laughs> um, she writes a weekly column for the Brattleboro Reformer on politics, education, and chickens, and goats, and farming. And tonight her talk is titled On the Emancipation of Eagles. Dr. Meg. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail. Great. Right. And thank you, everybody, for coming out on a cold night um, and to watch me as I step off my comfort zone into the land of technology. Uh, when I teach at Marlboro College, I have a chalkboard. I have a piece of chalk. I go over here. I make my little pictures. And so this is a big step for me. And, um, and at a certain point last week, I thought, I really can't do this. And then I started to play with this Prezi. And, um, got something going, which I'm going to share with you. We hope it works. Um, the other uh, exciting thing for me tonight is, well, there's two things. One is that the first time I ever spoke in front, or the first time I was ever a body in front of an audience was at Landmark College. Hmm. And I was performing in a dance piece choreographed by Allison Mott, and I played the part of a wolf. So there's a little bit of a uh, continuation here in that my first time here I was representing wolves, thanks to Allison Mott's choreography. And now I'm thinking about eagles um, because of Aldo Leopold and other thinkers. And this is other, uh, another honor for me because my dad is here, has come from Massachusetts to hear me talk. And first time my dad, I think, has seen me so mic'd up, <laughs> right? This is also kind of new. I've got technology all over me. I used to live in a yurt. I've had candles, the chalkboard. You get a, a notion that I'm stepping way out of my comfort zone. Um, so I got the idea for this talk, the emancipation of eagles, or how rights need something else to do their work, because I spent last summer, a chunk of last summer, in Flagstaff, Arizona, studying Aldo Leopold through a NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. Uh, and my dad is somebody who told me about Aldo Leopold many, many years ago when I was a kid. And um, I was intrigued by what a political theorist could learn from thinking about justice or social organisms using Aldo Leopold. Uh, and also Flagstaff, Arizona, that sounded great. So the US government, meaning you as taxpayers, paid for me and a bunch of other college professors to go to Flagstaff and think about Aldo Leopold, and uh, it was beautiful, and I got very depressed. The reason I got very depressed, and this is one of these hockey sticks, so if you read my column this week, you know about this. Abigail, can you point to this one on top? This hockey stick? That hockey stick, yeah. And uh, Arthur, who's in the audience, is going to recognize this one. This one starts at around 1776. There's one billion people on Earth. I'm not that old. No, <laughs> you don't know that. Right. One billion people on Earth, and then all of a sudden we go over here, and we're approaching eight billion people on Earth. Well, now, eight billion, one billion, that seems kind of manageable. We have enough room. But I don't like the way that shoots up, right? It begins to talk about a future where 
well, maybe I'd be happy because tonight there'd be people in every chair, there'd be people sitting up and down on these aisles, there would be people in the hallway. It would be such a dense human population. So maybe I'd be like, that's great. Um, still, it's a little troubling, particularly when the second hockey stick, and this is number of species becoming extinct, um, and that also goes through. It's kind of manageable, kind of manageable, kind of manageable. Along around the time the human population goes, woo, species extinction does the same thing. And that, up to now, over 50,000 species now extinct. So, oh, God, every time I see this chart, I think, what's the point? Here we are, human beings, right? Uh, Charlie, oh, I don't know where Charlie went. Charlie was here before. Charlie said, don't be nervous, Meg. You're coming to Landmark. We are all colleagues. You're sharing ideas with colleagues. Isn't that a lovely thing? But one of my ideas is things don't look good. So not such a good thing, especially this fifth, over 50,000 species extinct, like uh, passenger pigeon or the auk or there's many, many species. So um, ooh, I'm not supposed to do this because I'm mic'd, but I have to make that thing of how do we deal with that information? I say the words, and then I just feel sort of overwhelmed. Um, and there were many people in Flagstaff who deal with these hockey sticks all the time. They're environmental ethicists. They go into freshman incoming classes and they say, okay, we're going to talk about the environment and here's how we're going to talk about it. The first thing you should see is the population, woo! And the next thing you should see is species, gone, gone. Can't come back, gone. And then they talk about ethics. Um, and I thought, oh, I thought my job was hard. Political theory, I can talk about genocide. I can talk about violence, I can talk about rape as a tool of war. That's very, very depressing. But I found this even more depressing. But the environmental ethicists, they got up, they went to work, they were able to do it. So as, as I'm spending time with them and um, thinking about the things they're thinking about all the time and having lunch with them, going to have a beer with them in Flagstaff, a lovely town, if anybody here is from Arizona, I noticed that they kept going back to something that was making them feel better about the future. And that is this ethical timeline. And the idea is that things are getting better because ethics and who's included in our ethical community is actually expanding. So maybe it looked bad in 1776 for African Americans, for women, for, we could think of some other categories of people, uh, people who did not own land. And then as time goes on, more and more people get more and more rights. So the ethical community expands over time. And they kept talking about this in terms of, well, maybe this expansion of rights can help us with this problem that we have with those two hockey sticks. Now, I'm a political theorist, and I think, wow, you're putting a lot of hope in rights. And I tend to be a little bit skeptical. So I want to take you through this picture of how, how the, the um, the ethicists I met talk about ethics, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my concerns. But, oh no, we were doing so well for so long. We were doing, ah, look at that. That's actually the one I wanted, but how do we get rid of this? It'll disappear in a second. It will? Who said that? Oh, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff knows. Okay, that's good. All right, yay, it did. Uh, Aldo Leopold's land ethic is, does somebody want to read this? Anybody feel like reading this out loud? Please use a voice. Anything is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it does otherwise. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, what's your name? Max. Max. Okay. Thank you, Max. Um, so this is how we judge whether a community is healthy. 
In political theory, we might have said, we know a community is healthy when it is a just community. And we would be talking a lot about who gets to participate and how. For Aldo Leopold, we know that a community is working well when it is, has integrity, stability, and beauty. And the community that he's talking about is a biotic community. Anybody know what that might mean, a biotic community? the overall body of life. Doesn't it? Right, the body of life. And that's such a beautiful way of saying it. Um, Ed, right? Ted. Ted, sorry. <laughs> I say I do this and then I remember I put the T in. Um, right, the life, the bios. It's not just human beings in their ethical relationships to each other. It has now become ecological. So this is something to hold on to, a new way of judging whether or not an organism is healthy. It's a biological organism. It includes human beings, but it's no longer restricted to human beings. It is still ethical, which is something we've generally talked about human beings since, I don't know, Plato, before Plato. Uh, it, it is ethical, but it is a different kind of ethos. So, and the um, environmental ethicists were feeling like this idea was getting some traction. Whoa, don't you love how that does that? Um, Aldo Leopold wrote that in 1949. Then he died. He died, I think Oxford University Press had just told him, yes, we love your book, yes, we want to publish it, and then he died. So he didn't get to see what this idea did. But it held on in this country's consciousness because uh, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, in a dissent, Sierra Club v. Morton, and that's 1972, he's, he doesn't, I, actually, I should double check this. He obviously has read Leopold and is talking about a land ethic in that dissent. And he also makes this claim, the river as plaintiff. Love that? The river as plaintiff speaks for the ecological unit of life that it is a part of. So he recognizes the river as having standing to sue, but nobody else on the court does. Uh, nonetheless, the Endangered Species Act happens in 1973, which is a sense when the United States says, we feel like we have an ethical obligation to species. We don't like that hockey stick. We want to stop the hockey stick for species. And uh, one of the species that was protected is the bald eagle. So then we see how 2007, that bald eagle, that's a happy bald eagle, is no longer on the endangered species uh, list. And we could think of it as a rights-bearing eagle to the degree that Americans have recognized they have a certain obligation to the bald eagle. So that would be an, a success story, how rights, a very broad definition of rights, have helped the bald eagle. Um, these are coming up more and more in the news. So here's one that's fairly recent. Uh, chickens, factory farming. This is not a bad picture of factory farming. I probably could have found you some worse pictures. But this gets the point. Here are all the chickens. They're in the cages. We don't, uh, in, when this picture was taken in, outside of the state of California, uh, we don't have this notion that we have any ethical obligation to the chickens. The chickens are our property, or they're the property of Purdue or whoever. And we do with them what we like. Uh, we keep them in, change, in cages, because that seems expedient. So, but here's some good news. If you're a chicken. Uh, 2002, California, this is one of those, California is great for their propositions, right? They're always figuring out, what do the people really think about something? Well, it turns out in 2002, Californians were concerned about chickens. They wanted to know that they could move, they could turn around. Uh, I call it the hokey pokey chicken because the, the language in the statute gives the chickens the right to put their rights in, their lefts in, and to flap all around. <laughs> Now, there's also places to roost, which they didn't have before. So it's a recognition that chickens like to roost. And they also have nesting boxes. So the proposition in California made it law that chickens get to do what chickens like to do, and that human beings have an obligation 
to let these chickens ha take care of their needs. Now, that isn't to say that these aren't, I think they, these are probably egg birds because of the nesting boxes. Um, but that isn't to say that eventually they wouldn't be eaten. But there is this expansion that we're starting to see in terms of recognizing what animals need and our obligations to provide that. Okay. So, um, oh, I jumped ahead maybe too fast. Let me go back once. Can I do that? Yes, look at this. I go back. Yes. All right, I didn't have time because it takes a little while to put these things together. But, and uh, Arthur mentioned this, and a couple of people sent me emails when they heard I was going to give this talk. Did you hear about the orca whales? Yes. San Diego, right. Uh, there is now a, a federal U.S. federal judge who, um, what did he said? He basically said, who is considering whether animals, specifically killer whales at SeaWorld, enjoy constitutional protections against slavery. That the killer whales at SeaWorld are being treated as if they were slaves. And that uh, PETA brought a case. And PETA's argument, this is again what these people all tend to do, Brushing animals off as property is the same argument that was used against African Americans and women before their constitutional rights were protected. So if you give rights to African Americans, if you give rights to women, can we consider giving rights to chickens, bald eagles, and now orca whales? Um, so let's go back to Leopold for a second. Um, and we'll f look at the slavery issue in just a second. But somebody want to read this? Ethical criteria? Yeah, great. Ethical criteria have been extended to many fields of conduct with the um, corresponding shrinking shrinkages, shrinkages and those judged by expediency. Expediency only. Thank you very much for reading that. And what's your name? Michael. Michael. Thank you, Michael. I, I didn't want to read that. That's a mouthful. So, Michael, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the setup. Um, what is he getting at? I mean, it sounds beautiful on one level, and I uh, need to put arrows up so that I understand. That was my parsing this sentence. When there's Ethics extended, expediency is diminished. He's suggesting there's a correlation between that. So the more you grant ethics to members of a community, the greater the energy that should be in that community, and the less, that's that shrinkages word, whoever heard of that, the more, that expediency uh, diminishes. So when I'm thinking about that sentence, there's one way I could read it, and that is that once you've established that a thing has ethics and that we have obligations to it, you can no longer make an argument that says, I get to treat this as property as I see fit. And that would be expediency. So it's, it, a lot of this hinges on property. OK, now I apologize for this picture, but we kind of have to look at it. There's a picture of a slave. And it was obviously the master's decision that this slave would work better were he, I would assume it's he, to whip it. And it really becomes an it when you think of what's been done to that person. So if we take this in terms of um, ethics expansion, expediency diminished, this person's capacities to move are greatly reduced. They follow the will of the master. And the flip side of that, and this is something you can go to Aristotle and Hegel after him, the person who whipped this person is greatly diminished. You may know why? Why would the master be greatly diminished through this kind of relationship. Sort of counterintuitive. Yeah, Ted. Well, he could argue that he was not following the will of the master, and that 
Master right, so he was not following the, the master, and so he made the master with him? Is that to follow the argument? Well, I don't know if you say he made him yeah. with him. Yeah, right. Obviously, he's being punished for being what the master might consider to be truculent. Right, right. Did anybody hear what Ted was just saying about how if, if, if you consider the slave to be truculent or not going along with the program, and you're the master, you whip the slave. Uh, in that sense, maybe the, when the master is wanting something to be done, he needs to get it done through the slave. And that's where you see how the master's energy is actually greatly reduced. Because the master is incredibly dependent on the slave to get something done. And if that doesn't get done, then the master whips the slave. It's a relationship that's not pretty. And it's a relationship that doesn't allow a lot of energy. It's very, very focused. Yeah? Uh, it also seems to me that the master of whipping becomes, because it's an inhumane action, yeah. it becomes, in a sense, less human. Right, right, exactly. Thank you. And what's your name? Alan. Alan, thank you. Yeah, uh, Emerson made a great argument against slavery in that it turned everybody inhuman. You turn one class of people into property, everybody else becomes inhuman. And that, I mean, anybody looking at this picture, it's hard to look at. I, I got my back to it, so I have an advantage here. It doesn't make you feel good about being a human being. It reduces, it reduces. So, um, okay, what do I have next? <coughs> So, good news, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. That's a lovely thing. That means that that, that that relationship, that relationship based on expediency, based on getting something done, crops brought in, crops planted, whatever it was, that the expediency moved aside for more of an ethical relationship. So we have the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Lovely. And then it gets even better. 1957, Civil Rights Act, and we get to see how um, uh, descendants of African slaves have more mobility, more autonomy, more decision making. But this picture it still doesn't look too happy. And sure, okay, I picked a certain picture out, but I was somewhat random when I was going through my little Google images. The master-slave relationship, there's still an element of it haunting it. I don't know. You're, you're nodding up and down your head. Uh, why? How do we see that? Civil Rights Act should be good. Yeah. But the white men that are granting rights to the black Right. Under somewhat suspicious, you know, terms. And, and, the, and the look of concern on his face as he approaches the voting booth. So the power dynamic, I'm putting your words in your in my mouth, I'm putting my words maybe in your mouth a little bit, but the power dynamic um, doesn't look so good. So that's 1957. Now, according to the timeline, things should be getting better. That's, how, that's the logic of the ethical timeline. Every day and every way, things are getting better and better, more people have rights. So. But here's another, this isn't quite a hockey stick, but this is incarceration rates. Um, specifically, this top line, I don't know if we want our little laser printer on it or not, but that top line is for black male high school dropouts age 20 to 34. 1980, it's about 10% of the population. 2008, we are approaching 40% of the population in jail. That's enormous. Uh, the other rates are not anything to get too excited about, but it doesn't go through that, uh, you know, like population growth, species ex uh, going extinct, a lot of young black men in jail. What is going on with this world? That's a very, very troubling line. So, and here's another kind of hard picture. <coughs> That's what that looks like. So there's a lot of energy 
that is now curtailed, just like our chickens. Energy, people being able to choose where they go, that means that there's the ethical bonds are increasing. No, we've got a lot of energy being put behind bars, curtailed. And that's moving forward on our ethical timeline. Oh, gracious. Um, so we begin to wonder, well, what does this say about our ethical timeline? And I pulled out, you know, this is a troubling comparison. Men in jail, chickens in factory farms is not my, uh, other people have done this before me. It's to a certain degree shocking. And yet if we go with what you said in the back earlier about um, who has the power to make these decisions, this is not good decision making. So somebody's deciding that this is okay to have so many young black men in jail and somebody's deciding it's okay for this, so many chickens sitting in cages. Uh, and Leopold is hoping that's going to change. So here are two passages. Would somebody be willing to read this first quotation, the disposal of property? then as now a matter of expediency not of right and wrong yeah and in this line he's talking about land and how people own land so and I put these other two pictures here that the way we talk about this population of African-American young men without high school degrees it's a matter of expediency Just take them off the streets of South Bronx or, or wherever we are and put them uh, behind jars, bars, sorry. And that the same kind of expediency is happening here with the chickens. Um, and then the second quotation, the land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges, but not obligations. So when Leopold is writing this in 1949, he thinks, okay, I'm going to believe that it went down really well for African Americans. And I'm going to believe that the rights piece, turn property from something to be used at another person's discretion into something that we have some sort of ethical obligation toward. And I'd like to believe him, especially when I saw how sad the environmental ethicists were in Flagstaff, and they were banking on rights, making things better. But it was hard for me to buy this because as a political theorist, I look at rights and I think, well, it's, they're not doing exactly what they were supposed to do, particularly for a certain class of African Americans. But just as I'm about to give up on the whole thing, and I don't know what that looks like. Do you ever have that moment where you say, I'm going to give up on the whole thing, but then you have to keep breathing? Uh, I went back to this book Patricia Williams wrote. Um, it's called The Alchemy of Race and Rights. And uh, in it, Patricia Williams, first of all, is an interesting person. She is a law professor. She is a descendant of a white lawyer who raped her slave great-great-grandmother and then created this family genealogy. And now she is an African-American professor of law who teaches property law. And she used to have a blog called, uh, I think it was Confessions of a Mad professor or something, that there were so many contradictions just in her being that per periodically she had to go crazy, uh, which she describes most eloquently in this book. It's, she's a beautiful writer, maybe some of you have read her in The New Yorker, um, where she talks about too much cognitive dissonance, you might as well just go crazy. And then after she goes crazy, she gets back to her project. So she says this amazing thing. Anybody want to read this one? It's a lovely one to read. To say that blacks never fully believed in rights is true, yet it is also true that blacks believed in them so much and so hard that we gave them life where there was none before. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, turns out this whole question about rights, it's not about giving rights because that just reproduces what we saw in that civil rights picture that you articulated. It's about believing in them so hard that they have life. Now, I was so appreciative of Ted saying the biotic community is a community of life. The life 
cycle, the life process, the life web. Yeah, Ted, you want to say something? The oddest thing about this is uh, it says we gave them. Who's we and Black who's people. Them? Black people gave rights so much. We made them who's alive. Who? I think it's, she's talking about African Americans, blacks. That turned it all on its so head, African didn't it? African Americans gave African Americans life. Right. Yeah. Right. That's how it really works. If white people give African Americans rights, it looks like that picture. Mm -hmm. Well, I gave you this right to vote. Are you really a voter? We still have that now, right? Are you really a voter? I'm not sure you're really a voter. I gave you the rights to being a voter, and I'm going to sniff you out. <laughs> Doesn't look like a good voter to me. We'll get rid of it. But if you say, we're giving ourselves rights, that totally changes the whole thing. Uh, yeah, that all of a sudden now we have rights. is something that we give to ourselves. That's a completely different picture of rights that, that I had been thinking about. Um, so. Uh, it doesn't say we gave them to ourselves. It says we made them real. Yeah. We gave the rights life. Oh, yes. So okay. White oh. people have to believe in them too. As soon as they're, they become, you know, an existing yeah. concept. Right. Exactly. And that's an important distinction. Did everybody hear right. that? They, they gave yeah. the human race uh, the, the notion of equality. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, there was something, but now it's gone. Uh, an example of what this would look like, this idea of believing in rights so hard that they come to exist, might be, Majora Carter was here uh, last spring, and she be, uh, started, Major, she came to speak at the slow food movement. I don't know if people heard Majora Carter. Anyway, a very dynamic young woman from the South Bronx, and she created something called the Sustainable South Bronx, uh, which... The South Bronx is one of those locations where 40%, maybe even higher in the South Bronx, are going directly to jail. So, um, and I threw in that land ethic again near this to think about this new, not to think about communities in terms of justice, but to think about communities in terms of this biotic community and that it's right when something is being preserved, integrity, stability, and beauty. And that's a very different kind of picture. Now, and what um, Elena said about rights, and this is where my brain is stretching. Maybe you all have already stretched here, but my brain is still stretching, just like using this PowerPoint, where I'm trying to understand what does it look like to engage in an alchemy of rights, which is what Patricia Williams is talking about. What is getting transformed? So if rather than saying, oh, we gave this community the right to garden, we say this community began to believe so hard in itself, in its biotic whole, that it became real. That it's that kind of transformation that goes on. So we see that uh, in the South Bronx. Yeah, what's my next one? So Patricia Williams says, this is another great line. Anybody, you, you had your hand up before. You want to read this great line? Unlock rights from reification by giving them to slaves. Give them to trees. Give them to cows. Give them to rivers and rocks. They all deserve privacy, integrity, and self-assertion. Yeah, so that's Patricia Williams' idea. Keep giving them away, giving them away. And as we give them away, then we come to believe in them. Um, and then we'll understand her punchline is that we do not own the world, the world owns us. Yeah, Ted. What's the word reification? So reification is, is this notion where we take something that was alive and we turn it into a thing, something abstract, cold, lifeless. We could say legalistic. So if we want to get rid of law rights as just something abstract, we give them away. That's what she's arguing. Give them away. Give them to trees. Give them to killer whales. Give them to chickens. 
Okay, so, and then I, this, the, so this last piece, which is for my timeline, is this to me feels like, okay, maybe we are going forward. Maybe this is what it looks like. It's not necessarily a legislative act. It is believing in something in a neighborhood. In these are not on their way to jail. These are on their way to becoming gardeners. These two guys here. And this lot that it was an abandoned lot, received a lot of industrial waste, is now a place to believe in. But the, the belief comes through this giving the rights away. I mean, it really has, I, I hate to say this because I own property. It, it is the antithesis of property, a certain understanding of our relationship to property. Uh, so, my conclusion, just to do a little wrap up, is that Environmental ethics assume that the ethical advances of the past will support an increase of ethics to include killer whales, chickens, and bald eagles. So that's kind of going back to our, does it do it? No. If I do this, I want to go to my big screen. Oh, I know what I do. I go here. Oh, gracious. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Now I do this. No, I don't know how to make it do it. Oh, home. Brilliant. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so if environmental ethics assumes this timeline as a way of dealing with these two hockey sticks where things are getting worse, that I think that field would be well served by considering the African American experience. Um, and that means two things. On the one hand, that means that rights are not doing what we hoped they would do. The Civil Rights Act just did not do enough. That those massive incarceration rates suggest the Civil Rights Act did not do that enough. Um, and that rather what we need is this other piece of wisdom from the African American experience specifically Patricia Williams, Williams, that we should love the rights of eagles, the rights of chickens, the rights of slaves, so much that we feel that pull much more strongly than any claim to ownership of property. So it's, a, it's an emotional shift. Rather than thinking about property, to think about this in terms of feeling that pull of the rights that we're giving away. I think that's what puts us in a biotic ecological existence. We're giving something away. We feel that obligation. Uh, we would do well to consider how much the planet owns us, for it is only through her beauty, integrity, and security that we have any life at all. And that's the presentation. Now. Yeah. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah. How do we talk about giving rights when we've said you can't really give rights mm -hmm. to another person? You can enter into the belief in it. So how does it work with not the non-human part? Right. Um, well, I. Ed, could you repeat the question? Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, Elena was asking this, and I'm going to go to the place where uh, she, oh, can I do that? Um, it's where she talks about giveaway rights. And this is Patricia Williams. Patricia Williams says, what, how, and Elena asks, how can we say give rights to trees, give rights to rivers, give rights to slaves, when, as we discussed, when you give rights to somebody else, that's actually perpetuating a power dynamic. I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. So how, how do we deal with that, this giving of rights? Well, I thought it was interesting, and I can't go back and find, because I'm not that good in my Prezi. Uh, I'm actually following it right now, as opposed to leading it. That she says, give it to slaves, give it to rocks, give it to stones. She's talking about our capacity to give something to something that is not human. Now, when I say slave, I don't mean to, to reproduce slavery, but the logic of slavery is that the human being is an object. And she seems to be suggesting by this, if we can expand 
our sense of giving rights to trees, to killer whales, that's going to change us. And I guess I'm beginning to think that if we're going to improve the situation, the terrible racial situation in the United States, we may need to go way out to giving rights away to everything, and then we may be in a better position to, to think about rights vis-a-vis -vis race. Yeah, Elizabeth in the back. It, it may be a matter, too, I was thinking of what giving away means yeah. uh, in that sentence. And um, the way I was hearing the context, it seemed more about relinquishing mm -hmm. uh, than parceling out. Right. And saying, this is mine, and now I'm going to give it. Yeah. It's more like a relinquishing right. or just yeah. uh, or an expansiveness. Yes, yeah, so it's not really right. Right. anything to, right. to, to, to hold. hold. But it's not yours, really. Yeah. It's not yours, really. Mm -hmm. It's not yours to give away. Right. So in that giving it away is much more like that. Yeah. yeah. Nice. True. Thank you. Um, there was a hand in the back. Is that Max? Yeah, but I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. First one. So, no, nah, it's okay. I'll, I'll pass on this one. You I, sure? Yeah, we had to do something else. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and I didn't get, ever get your name. Uh, Leslie? Leslie. A couple things. One, I was thinking about, this. I have trouble with the word rights. Yeah. And um, it seems to me that rights are always something that somebody gives. It's God-given right or it's a law mm -hmm. giving rights away. And I guess I'm wondering if, you know, the, for me, the replacement would be, you know, to give compassion mm. for the suffering, not to give rights. Right. Um, and I'm also, as a question, I'm wondering if we kept expanding and expanding our compassion or right giving, then certainly we are all going to stop eating meat. Right? Then we're going to stop being what? Being able to eat meat. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also, it's personally, I raise chickens and I kill some of them. And they're living a pretty nice life, and I feel incredibly obligated to them, but then I also eat them. Do I see them as my property? I think I do when I kill them. So that's why I mean I'm stretching at this very place where if I really look at my behavior, but my behavior has changed enormously since I started killing them, about meat in general. Hmm. So that I understand every time I'm eating meat, somebody mm -hmm. got killed. And maybe after a while I would decide to be a vegetarian or vegan? I don't know, but yeah. Right, Alan. Um, <clears throat> a lot of indigenous cultures uh, hunt and you know kill an other animals, but typically they do it in such a way that they are essentially communicating from their spirit to the animal spirit, and they give thanks and they uh, go out of their way to not waste any part of the animal. They go out of their way to um, essentially, you know, uh, how do I say it? sort of be on the same playing field, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, in a spiritual sense. Yeah. And I've, I've been, I've lived in communities like that, and it's, it's very powerful. Right. And when you talk about that, you get the idea of eating an animal transforms the animal and transforms the eater. So and I feel like that's this, mm -hmm. this understanding of the alchemy of race and rights that Patricia Williams talks about that there's this transformation that should take place. And that rights tend to be very reified, which, you know, I think, Leslie, is what you're getting at, that they tend to be very static. They give them in a very static way that what we're looking for is something that transforms the entire relationship. Uh, yeah, over here. Well, eagles, for example, kill other life forms and uh, eat them. Right. So what distinction are you drawing between them and humans? And, and I would say that there's, there's no, I mean, I would never say that, okay, I want to make sure that I'm not making a case that's PETA's case. PETA's case would be we don't hurt animals at all. I, what I'm interested in is the ethical obligations within a community that human Americans now have with eagles. Just, that's just a matter of fact. You get an enormous fine if you kill an eagle, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a federal offense. It's a federal it's offense. In jail time. Yeah. So all of this this eagle is not property. This eagle has rights attached to it in that sense of we have obligations to it. Does I that make I sense? I perhaps did not ask a clear question yeah. because by, by 
by the same token, just as uh, the eagle has the right to remain alive, the eagle also seems to have the natural right to kill whatever it wishes to kill and right. eat it. Right. So what distinction are we drawing between mm -hmm. an eagle doing that and another mm -hmm. animal, humans, us, doing mm -hmm. the same thing? Right, right. And I wouldn't draw a distinction about killing animals. I would draw a distinction about factory farming that just cages them. Because mm -hmm. that seems awfully close to slavery. And uh, Emancipation Proclamation we should be out of that. Uh, Arthur. I'm looking at your chart. And you have three lines there. Uh -huh. One is the upward curving population, and the other one is the another one is the upward curving extinction rate. Right. And they they, uh, they look correlated, and as a matter of fact, one can demonstrate that they are. There right. is a cause and effect relationship. Yeah. <coughs> But now I'm suggesting that you could have had your third line, mm -hmm. the ethical timeline, mm -hmm. also curving up. Mm -hmm. Because it, the, the, the ethical values, mm -hmm. as you described, mm -hmm. keep escalating. Right. And so now you have a new curve, mm -hmm. which may or more, more or less approximates the other. And now my question is, yeah. since a correlation doesn't really prove a cause and effect. I wonder whether you make any suggestions about whether the the fact that the ethical timeline, if it were drawn as an upward uh, moving curve, mm -hmm. has in fact any relationship to mm. the uh, increasing population or the or the increasing extinction. Right, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean that that's such a marvelous question in terms of to how to then begin to study how that would look. Mm. So if if I began by hearing about this ethical timeline and, and the way it's often drawn is in expanding circles, but my president didn't offer that, it just gave me a timeline. But that the expanding circles shows a sort of uptick. But then I had my political theorist skepticism and I thought, I'm not sure I believe that. But now that I've gone this far, and I think your question is absolutely right, there's things that are starting to happen here. Will that stop the rate of species extinction? Well, not. It won't have much effect if the population keeps doing what it's doing. That's a guess. But just looking at this evidence. So what needs to happen on an ethical framework to get the population to stop growing? That's a very difficult question. And uh, at the Institute, it turned out that oftentimes people from the first world would say, let's work on birth control. And people from the third world would say, how come you guys live so long? <laughs> you know, population. It's, there's a reason why the population is so big. Because a lot of people are living way too long. I have exceeded my time on this earth, probably, 56. Maybe 45. I should have just said, OK, time for the next crew to come in. But that's, those are the kind of questions we have to ask when we're looking at population. If we start giving all these, if we change our community to all of a sudden it's much more of a biotic community that we're caring about chickens and orca whales and things of that sort, would that change our need to populate so much? Maybe our community would say, oh, me and the chickens, we're like this. If the chicken is happy, I'm happy. I see all the chickens. I don't need to reproduce so much. My progeny is chickens. I don't know. Let me revise my question slightly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I made the silly suggestion that possibly an upward curving ethical progression uh, was correlated with either of those two lines. Let me just say, why do you think uh -huh. that over these decades, um, there's been an expanding notion of ethics. Oh. What, what has driven that? Right, right. Well, there's a dark answer. The dark answer would be when technology and industrial capitalism is expanding, expanding, taking a lot of resources, creating a social hierarchy that's getting very uh, vertical so that some people are living at a very high standard and lots of people are living at a low standard, rights has been a way to pacify the population. 
because you give the next group of people who are, might be uppity some rights, and maybe they'll say, oh, now I'm a member of all this lovely uh, picture of technology and growth and capitalism. So rights, and this is not my idea, this is other people's ideas too, that rights work to diminish political demands on the state. So that would be one sort of dark explanation. Another way, and I'm just like starting to think this way, so I don't know, and, and I'm very eager to hear what other people have to say. Uh, I think that we feel better when we expand the ethical community. I think we actually feel terrible around slavery, and I think we feel terrible around abject poverty. So that when we are able to say something to ourselves about how we would like to live better, that we honestly want that, and that this becomes a way to do that through rights. And rights, rights have been incredibly effective. The Emancipation Proclamation did a lot. The Civil Rights Act did a lot. Sometimes I've been accused of being too hard on rights. And I think that's a very good accusation. Because this happened. Why did it happen? Because we felt better when we did that. We took that step and we thought, oh, that's a better way to live. I don't know. Other, other, other people's ideas. Any other maturing. questions? What? We're maturing as a species? Well, that's, that is generally the story that's told, especially Alma Leopold tells that story. We used to treat people badly. We used to treat people like property. And now we're better. We're maturing. That's the whole premise of the ethical timeline. And the way we're now treating people better, can't we treat the land better? I want to believe that's true. Of course, there's more people enslaved now than there was yeah. during the time of slavery. Right. Think of the slavery. Right. Slavery has not gone away. Mm -mm, not at all. And even in the United States, uh, the incarceration rates now are the 1850s number of slaves in the country in 1850. It's not going away. It's just metamorphosized. So are we really treating people better? Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, Ted. The good idea might be that if, the, if we learn to respect the rest of life better, to recognize all the rights, mm -hmm. possibly the other two curves might start to come down. Right. That's what I'm betting on right now. Yeah. Did, did everyone hear what Ted said? If, if we expand these rights to all things, this might have an effect on our behavior. Uh, vis-a-vis population. Yeah, um, Max and then Elizabeth. I, I agree with that statement, however it depends on the rights and, and to whom and what you're talking about. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, when you put the, the picture of the men in prison with the picture with the chickens in the cages, right. personally I kind of disagreed, I mean, with, yeah. with having that correlation there. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about rights for chickens mm -hmm. versus the rights with people, you know, in slavery, I mean, there's a, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that, you know, bringing more rights to, to you know, certain animals is, is a step in the right direction, but, you know, there's only so many rights we can give to certain things for it to, like, go over the line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a, you have to gradually get up there. I mean, uh -huh. that's why, you know, through history, it just it gets better and better and better. I mean, personally, I don't know the answer to why I mean, I think, I don't know his name, he was talking about why when the population is growing, uh -huh. you know, ethics is, is progressing in a more positive direction. Uh -huh. But um, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I agree that, that, we sh that it's good to, you know, have ethics in that, you know, helping, helping people and, you know, slavery and that whole thing. But I'm just, I'm just a little confused in, in when you're talking about two different huge things such as slavery versus you know sure. animals rights right. you know how, how far are you going and what do you mean by you know yeah give rights give rights to trees and, and yeah. people I mean it's a little it's a little broad of a statement yeah that. you're absolutely right I mean it, it's it takes everything we have in this world and undermines it and and uh, the PETA people uh, in the argument that just went uh, before the judge in San Diego they said, well, they used to say if we got rid of slavery, the whole world would fall apart. And we still got rid of slavery. So what, what, what do we, the world will have to change in order to accommodate this new vision. But will we get something better? 
if we do make that change, and, and here's the real other thing, given where these lines are going, well, we could just go out because we have overpopulation and no species. So, and, and I don't know if you heard the latest terrible news, this is right before Valentine's Day. I have this dark sense of humor, I hope I don't offend you, but chocolate, 30% uh, of the chocolate harvest is lost to climate change, disease, and bad farming. So, no chocolate <laughs> could be in our future. Now that's the sort of thing where we'd say, wow, we need to think about the emotional life of cacao trees. I could actually imagine that happening. I'm a chocoholic, I love my chocolate. And, and the same could be said for chickens. If chickens get wiped out because of a disease in factory farming, if, we, if the shift turns from we own the world to the world owns us, well, those, that's what I think these two lines are saying. The world owns us. These lines get up too high, we're not here. So something's got to shift. Uh, and Elizabeth had her hand up and then um, Jane. Yeah, I, I'm Elizabeth. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know exactly how to phrase what I'm saying, but when I look at the ethical timeline, which is very straight, um, it, it would work for me as a timeline if there were little arrows pointing to all the points of attack uh -huh. on, on the ethical timeline, because if I, if I think now of um, community, I think of that as very different from government, mm -hmm. governmental mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Sorry. And, I, and I feel as if the ethical timeline is always being pressured and attacked oh, and, like, dis and disrupted. When mm -hmm. you say attack, like, you're, like yeah. these things happen, like the Endangered Species Act happens and then it's under attack. Yes, and, and you know, national parks are protected, right? Right. Until but, it is expedient. But they're only protected until a government decides right. to deprotect them. Yeah, like, right. Example. And, there, and then we understand why Leopold, that's a perfect example, why did Leopold see ethics expand and then expediency diminishes that. So national parks are protected until it becomes expedient to do otherwise. And there's not enough belief in these ethics democratically for people to say, wait a minute, that would be like destroying my aunt in front of my eyes. But we, we haven't reached that, but that's, that's kind of where what the job is. So Jane had her hand up. And yeah, then I, I don't know how to phrase this, but the how rights need something else to do their work has yeah. me has had me thinking. Yeah. Um, and it seems that you're describing two communities. One is a legal community in which the eagles there was an endangered species act and and the reverse hockey stick, the Eagles mm -hmm. were going down and then right. they came back. Right. And then there's a moral community, which is the ethical timeline. And the question, and it's sort of in that colon between ethics and expediency, yeah. that the two communities mix it up mm -hmm. so that we get enough ethical, oh my God, oh my God, and we get an Endangered Species Act. And whatever it takes to get to the oh my God, oh my God, is, is what has to happen, and right. that's where I'm, you know. Right, yeah. I mean, at what point, is it when we hit nine billion that we go, oh my God, oh my God? Is it when we lose 70,000 species, do we go, oh my God, oh my God? Right now, expediency seems to keep, just as you mentioned, jump back in. It's like this thing we have going on, yeah. There's another in the back. Uh, Elena, and then Arthur. Oh, I know. You really studied Leopold, so I wonder, could you say a little bit about what he means by those three, um, yeah. those three uh, criteria? Integrity, stability, and beauty. Yeah. I'm tempted to pass this on to an ecologist. Like, why would integrity and stability and beauty be so important for a land ethic? Arthur. <laughs> You had your hand up. Why don't you uh, take that one? Yeah, what, what would you say? Come on, why don't you take that one? No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it's, it's curious. This building used to be a science building, and I used to lecture where you standing. Wow. And in a course that I taught here, I 
I used um, the San County Almanac. Wow. <laughs> And so this is this is uh, somehow bringing back curious memories, and I'm delighted to um, have you bring these all up in a beautifully clear new way. I, I think what Aldo Leopold was aiming at was he, he recognized the importance of what we now call ecosystems, mm -hmm. where the um, the various components. Um, es establish a, a certain continuity, and if you disrupt it, mm -hmm. you're 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 damaging things. Um, the the beauty is the is the most curious mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that that's a concept that somehow is not quote ecological. Mm -hmm. It's 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 um, I guess in some almost theological mm -hmm. and, and ethical. But the, the other two simply mean that, I think, that um, the, the land ethic is based upon a respect for the interaction between the plants and the animals and, uh, and the things that uh, put all of this together. Right. So that's right. probably the best I can do off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. Karen had her hand up. Is that did you have and then maybe one or two more questions? Yeah. Yes? Did you have your hand up, Karen? No. Okay. Uh, oh, I got two. Is uh, there let's let's do two more questions. Okay. Oh. Right, so Alan. <laughs> no, are you Alan? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I, I can't help but think of a, a quote by Pierre de Chardin where he said that, uh, biologically speaking, human beings are fast approaching the point where we need to choose between mass suicide and adoration. Wow. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. Um, I'd love to know the citation of that, maybe after the question. Thank you. Tom. Uh, before I, I do want to something else. Before I do that, I wanted to commend you for bringing up Aldo Leopold again way back in several previous slides ago, how the lead pole had a profound effect on me. Yeah. In my very first environmental studies class in college, I read the same kind of moment, mm -hmm. and the rest is history. Right. You know, I, <laughs> I, that became my profession and my passion, mm -hmm. and I can say that it was directly attributable to him mm -hmm. in a very big way. Right. But what I want to do is ask you a question about something else that that really occurred to me that I'd almost forgotten from another previous life, but not quite that far back, where I lived in, in South Asia for several years, and I ran across and became very familiar with certain peoples there that uh, reflect upon what we're talking about here, who in some ways were way, way ahead of uh, what you're talking about here, because this was decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they include some people who are Krishna followers, and I'm not talking about the people who live in air, who live in airports, who you see in airports, <laughs> right. but I'm talking about a very ancient religious uh, sect of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And the Krishna followers I knew were so reverent of the natural world that they would not eat anything mm -hmm. that they had to kill. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't about animals, this was about anything. So they would not eat any root plants, mm -hmm. they would not eat anything, any plant mm -hmm. that had to be killed. So they subsisted totally on, on plants wow. that cool. either died on their own, or they picked, or wow. they took part of. And mm. they had that ethic already there. And that ethic is centuries, <coughs> millennia maybe. Right. right. And also in South Asia, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but there's a, a group called the Jains. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I saw Jains, and they walk around with masks and these little sweepers. Mm -hmm. And they, everywhere where they walk, they're sweeping everything out of their way. They don't want to inhale any insects. They don't even want to inhale any microbes mm -hmm. that they might damage or kill. Mm -hmm. And that's right. And that religion is like two thousand years old. Right. So you know, humans have already gotten to this place yeah. that we're talking about. For some like people way over here uh, way, on the way, top. Way, way, way. Yeah. Right? Which is really interesting. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. So right. That, it makes me think. What happened to the rest? Of yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. It's a cultural difference, but it's a, yeah. it, it's really intriguing to, to think right. about. Right. 
Yeah, so and thanks. Actually, are living that way. And, and oftentimes these things are religions, right? So here we have a little bit of the religion of rights in the United States, the secular re religion perhaps, in the sense of how rights can transform a terrible situation into something much better, a redemption. Uh, and you're talking about another religion. I put you over here because it began so long ago. Um, so that may be, we, do we need a new kind of religion in this country? I don't know. Well, the thing, that was the thing, though, is that it's, a, it's something you've got to feel. You know, it's not an intellectual thing. Right. And so if you want to, if people want to adapt this, adopt this kind of ethic, it's not something that's going to work by legislation, like you said. Yeah. You know, that's why you got scared about, oh, rights, you know? Yeah, right. You know, it's, it, people are going to have to incorporate it into the right. being. Yeah, I love this term, adoration. That's mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate this whole conversation because it helps me in my thinking. <clears throat> coming out.